Thanks for joining this episode of the number 86 lecture series, where we discuss classical and modern jurisprudence. Today's episode features Christopher Green, Professor of Law and Jamie L. Witten, Chair in Law and Government at the University of Mississippi School of Law. As always, the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. How does philosophy make someone a better lawyer, judge, or legal scholar? How do you explain jurisprudence to a class of law students? Well, one thing I could tell a student who is wondering how thinking about philosophy, thinking about jurisprudence is going to affect them as a lawyer, I might begin actually by causing them to be more worried about that case. If you look at philosophical reasoning in ethics, unfortunately, it seems to be the case that an awful lot of people who learn how to draw very careful ethical distinctions tend to be much better about weaseling out of their obligations as a matter of morality. If you think about children who get really, really good at drawing distinctions, they tend to be able to evade your instructions and do things they really know they shouldn't be doing, but they say, well, mama and daddy did not tell me exactly not to do that thing. Skill and artistry can be a dangerous thing with respect to morality. I would start out with a student like that saying, well, you should be a little bit more worried maybe than even you were before. On the other hand, if you are able to draw distinctions, if you are able to have good philosophical sense, drawing the distinctions that are real, good, proper distinctions, you're gonna be a better lawyer, you're gonna be a better judge. That's what lawyers do. That's what judges do, draw distinctions properly. Technical training is different from being a good philosopher. Being good at drawing distinctions is different from drawing the right distinctions. And drawing the right distinctions might not mean drawing lots of distinctions. Being good at drawing lots and lots and lots of distinctions, that's not always the right way to go because some of those distinctions might be spurious. There are, in fact, things that are analogous to others, and there are some distinctions that really do need to be blurred. If we distinguish things that are, in fact, the same, that can be just as bad as treating things the same that are, in fact, different. There's a distinction between knowing the right principles and actually living the right principles. Aristotle talked about the notion of acrasia, uh, sometimes called weakness of will, uh, being very good at knowing the right thing to do is obviously different from actually implementing those sorts of things. And again, this is an error that gets made in Dred Scott, assuming that the framers were incapable of asserting principles inconsistent with those on which they're acting. That's just a mistake. Anybody can make distinctions and make proper distinctions with principles that they don't live out in their lives. Lawyers can do the same thing. People founding a country can do the same thing. Notwithstanding that possible disjunction, it's still very important to make the right distinctions and to have philosophical skill to be careful and not be sloppy in making distinctions. Should students care about the philosophical premises of their other law school classes? One big reason to care about the basic premises of your law classes, it's a reason that might surprise you. The fact is that everything in the law is constantly changing. The stuff that we're worried about most immediately today is not going to be the stuff that we're worried about 10 years from now. When you're a law student, you're trying to train yourself. You're trying to fill your mind with the sorts of things that are gonna be useful to you 10, 15, 40 years from now. The important thing for you to prepare to be a lawyer circa 2050 is not going to be the details of the case that just came out last week but the basic principles underlying contract law as such, or tort law as such, constitutional law as such, those are much more likely to be the kind of things we're still worrying about long after the issues of the present day have boiled down. 
If you dig down to bedrock in your field, you're much more likely to have an understanding that is going to be durable across changes in technology. So how are we going to deal with self-driving cars? I don't know. You don't know either. But I do know it's pretty likely that understanding the basic nature of tort law, the basic nature of, say, cheapest cost avoider analysis, that's going to be the kind of thing that once we understand the relevant risks, we'll be able to analyze new technologies that we can't even imagine uh, today. We'll be able to think about those in those terms. If you look at the broad sweep of legal history, of constitutional history, I don't know what's coming next, but I'm pretty sure whatever it is that's coming next is one of the things that's happened in the last many hundreds or thousands of years. Knowing the full history, knowing the basic principles that have guided the law and areas of the law in the past is the kind of thing that is going to be most durably useful in preparing for a career in the law. Do you have any advice on how students should approach the cases they read in school? One question that a lot of people have when they look at cases, and some of them are in constitutional law or other areas, they look at a bunch of cases and their professor will tell you, they'll look at a case and will say, well, here's five problems about that case. They look at another case and say, well, here's another problem with that case. They find problems with almost every single case they see. They get cynical. And a lot of people respond to this sort of thing happening over and over and over. And they say, oh, it's just all a bunch of malarkey. The judges are constantly just making it up. None of this stuff that we're reading matters at all. It's all just, sometimes they say, it's all just epiphenomenal. It's not really what's going on. It's like the heat being produced by a machine. We're chugging along and you wouldn't analyze the processing of a machine, how the machine works in terms of just the heat getting produced. That's just an extra phenomenon, not the real thing going on. Some people look at the law and they say, the reasons that judges offer those are just made up extra stuff. That's not really what's going on. What's really going on is somebody's ox is getting gored. How should law students or lawyers think about this kind of criticism? Well, one thing to keep in mind is that human beings, they do in fact behave in terrible ways a lot of the time. So we don't want to look at human nature with rose-colored glasses and just assume, oh, everybody's statement of reasons is exactly what's going on in their mind. It's really explaining what their motives are. However, it's also not good to be completely cynical and say, it doesn't matter what the quality of the reasoning is. And here's why. Even if judges are completely cynical and don't really care about those reasons. They do care about their reputation for looking reasonable. Robert Bork had a wonderful line. He said, the way an institution advertises tells you what it thinks its customers demand. The reasons that are offered in judicial opinions you might say, oh, it doesn't matter what those reasons are because the judges didn't think they matter. Even if the judges don't think they matter, if the judges think the audience cares about the quality of those reasons, it's still extraordinarily important to understand whether those reasons fit together. The coherence of an opinion is going to matter if only in terms of the reputation of the judge. Judges who care what people think about them are going to try to make their opinions look reasonable, even if that's not what's truly motivating them. And I think this kind of consideration can help you as a law student, can help you as a lawyer or a law professor, understand the importance of the coherence of opinions and actual rationales, because that's how they advertise, that's how they assume people demand that they behave. And in fact, that is how a lot of people do demand that they behave. They are required to articulate reasons and the quality of those reasons matters, if only in terms of their reputations. 
Some lawyers have good reputations because they are good lawyers. What are some virtues that a good lawyer should have? One very important virtue that is, I think, something lawyers constantly need to uh, exercise. I'm not sure quite what the name would be uh, for an Aristotelian analysis of it, but you have to know how to work yourself out of a job. And if you only want to litigate things, if you only want to fight with people about some disputed point of law and don't know how to settle a case, for instance, you're not going to serve your client's interests well. People who are very good litigators are not going to serve their client's interest if all they do is litigate. Similarly, if people, all they want to do is settle a case and make things go away, if they're never willing to litigate, aren't going to get as good a deal for their clients as they could otherwise. Some lawyers succumb to the temptation to think, well, we don't want to do too good a job for our clients because if we do that, it'll kill the golden goose. Some people working for defense firms think, well, we don't want the environment to be too good for our clients because then they wouldn't need us. I think there is a particular temptation of lawyers to only seek the changes in the law that would benefit them personally. The virtue of justice or disinterest in seeking the welfare of our clients and everybody in society as opposed to just our personal good. There is a strong, strong temptation of lawyers to say, I want to get my little niche and be able to serve my little well-paid corner of the world and charge my clients all the fees that I have to be charging and not really make things better in a way that I can work myself out of a job. The importance of being willing to work yourself out of a job, then go to another job and work yourself out of that job, solve things, get things done. I think the temptation not to do that is a strong one for lawyers. The opposite of that type of job in the private sector is a political job that serves the public. Does jurisprudence encourage political engagement? Jurisprudence and politics, the relationship between those is going to depend on how exactly we understand jurisprudence. Both of them have a certain relationship to views about human flourishing, views about what promotes the common good, the general good of society. There is, I think, an inherent relationship between politics. So politics is how we decide what to do uh, com communally as a society. There's an inherent connection between how we do politics and our view of what in fact promotes human flourishing. If you have fundamental conflicts about the nature of the good, the nature of human flourishing, you're going to have fundamental conflicts in your politics as a society. I think there's no getting around that sort of tie. But then we have the question, well, are conflicts in jurisprudence inherently tied to politics? That is going to depend on the extent to which conflicts in jurisprudence are tied to conflicts in our notions of human flourishing. And that is going to be true on certain understandings of jurisprudence, but not on others. If we think about jurisprudence as the nature of moral reality, if we think there's a strong tie between the law and the nature of moral reality because of the nature of law, because we want to use the word law in a natural law sense, well, there's a strong tie between that and human flourishing. And of course, the tie between human flourishing and politics means that that kind of notion of law is going to have a close tie to our politics. On the other hand, the positivistic aspects of jurisprudence, in Aquinas' terms, who has care of the community, what does it mean for a law to be promulgated, how is the law promulgated, what particular actions have been promulgated, those sorts of considerations do not have an inherent necessary connection with human flourishing. And because of that, because of that merely contingent connection, they are only going to have a merely contingent connection with politics. 
Another important consideration about our politics is it is going to depend on the extent to which we might or might not have consensus about certain issues and not others. If we live in a society where almost everybody agrees on certain aspects of what constitutes human flourishing, those people, the people in that society, are not going to have to have a bunch of political fights about those aspects of their common life together. They can fight about other things. Lincoln, at one point early in his career, said, I want our national politics to go back to being about boring things like sub-treasuries and how we manage our finances and commercial policy. I don't want it to be about fundamental aspects of right and wrong like slavery. However, Lincoln said, until we settle basic aspects of how we deal with questions of right and wrong like slavery, we can't go back to a politics that deals with boring technical things about sub-treasuries and the like. Does jurisprudence provide a framework where political questions could be evaluated and discussed in a nonpartisan manner? One thing that philosophical distinctions can bring to our political dynamic is that they give the opportunity for intermediate positions. So we don't have to have all or nothing answers to questions. So if you read through Aristotle, you'll very, very frequently find him answering some question, well, that's true in one sense and not true in another. So if you look at the meaning application distinction, it gives you the opportunity for a nuanced response. One thing that a meaning application distinction gives you is it gives people the opportunity to say, well, we agree about the general principle here. What we disagree about is the facts. So you can clarify exactly what it is you disagree about. If you're careful about distinguishing between merely verbal disputes and real disputes about the nature of reality, it can help lower the temperature allow people to be more careful and slow down and not tear each other to pieces thinking they disagree about absolutely everything. If you make careful distinctions, it's easier to find common ground. You might think about if you're looking for common ground on a particular area of ground, the more subdivisions you make in the ground and small bit distinctions between one kind of position and another, the more distinctions like that you make, the more likely it is that you're going to find that two people have the same views about at least some small part of it. And if people can agree about at least one small part of it, well, that's something you can build on. But if you are viewing everything as an undifferentiated mass, if you see your political opponents as entirely wrong about every single thing they say, it's going to be much more difficult to have a common political life. I would like to end our theoretical discussion with a more practical question. How do philosophical ideas have an effect on actions in the real world? One way that ideas have an effect on the real world is if somebody comes up with some crazy idea and then other people go out and try it and it turns out to be a terrible idea. This unfortunately, I think, has been the case with a number of bad economic ideas. In philosophy, it tends to be a little bit longer range. So when somebody comes up with a new way of doing logic, other people don't run out and say, ah, I'm going to implement this new way of doing logic. However, for two of the distinctions that we talked about earlier, we can actually see effects in the world from those distinctions breaking down. So think about the distinction between world to mind and mind to world directions of fit. That's the distinction between being a judge, making judgments about how things are, and being a legislator, determining how things are. In the 20th century, there were a lot of people intellectually who said, I just don't think there is a difference between those two things. I don't think there's a difference between being a judge about an external reality and being a legislator, making that reality be a certain way. As that distinction begins to blur in the minds of a lot of people, because of that philosophical mistake, as I would look at it, 
Because of that, people start saying, well, I guess it must be okay, sometimes at least, for judges to be legislators. Because after all, they have the job of saying what the law is, and there's not a distinction between saying what it is and making it be how it should be. If that's the case, then you're going to get judges behaving very differently than they would if you drew that distinction. Similarly, if you're going to distinguish meaning from application, that enables your interpretive theory to have a certain stability and say that meaning is anchored and doesn't change even though we live in a changing world, even though applications change. In the 20th century, there were a lot of philosophers who attacked the analytic synthetic distinction there were some legal philosophers who responded to the meaning application distinction and said, that's not how it works. If you change the application, that's what it means to change the meaning as well. If you adopt that theory of language, that view of how words work, you're not going to care as much. You're not really going to care at all about meaning changing because when you say, well, meaning changes, that's just the same thing as saying that applications change and applications have to change given that we're in a changing world. So the collapse in the minds of some people of a meaning application distinction or a sense reference distinction, analytic synthetic distinction, comprehension extension distinction, those sorts of distinctions, if those get blurred, we're gonna have a much more difficult time adhering to a fixed meaning. It's really going to be impossible to adhere to a fixed meaning. So those are two instances where if we have certain philosophical views, blurring distinctions, different things are gonna happen out there in the world. Maintaining clarity of thought, maintaining a rigor to how we think about things, those will help us maintain certain social structures that will decay otherwise. Thank you for listening to this episode of the number 86 lecture series on jurisprudence. The spirit of debate of our founding fathers animates all of the number 86 content, encouraging discussion and critical reflection relative to how each subject is widely understood and taught in law schools and among law students. Subscribe to the number 86 lecture series on your favorite podcast platform to have each episode delivered the moment it's released. You can also go to fedsoc.org slash number 86 for lectures and videos on federalism, separation of powers, the judiciary, and more. Thanks for listening. See you in class.